So hello, and thank you for joining us for the November 2020 Iowa Bibliophiles Talk. I will start us off with a, the University of Iowa Acknowledgement of Land and Sovereignty Statement, which I believe was just approved fairly recently. So the University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Chippewa, Iowa, Kickapoo, Menominee, Miami, Missouri, Omaha, Osage, Oto, Ottawa, Ponca, Potawatomi, Sac and Fox, Sioux, three affiliated tribes, and Ho-Chunk or Winnebago nations. The following tribal nations, Omaha tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, Ponca tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, and Ho-Chunk nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations and the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, understanding the historical and current experiences of native peoples will help inform the work we do collectively as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, enrollment, and retention efforts, acknowledging our past, our present, and future Native nations. So today's speaker is Laura Mickelson, Assistant Professor and Project Archivist at Grinnell College. Laura's name may sound familiar to those of you at the University of Iowa who have spent some time time and special collections over the past few years. She was our Olson graduate assistant from early 2019 through 2020. So I'm thrilled that she is rejoining us today after quite a long wait to talk about her work with and findings in the Brewer Lee Hunt collection at the University of Iowa. So over to you, Laura. Great, thank you, Margaret. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Mm -hmm. And we'll get started. Um, so my name is Laura Michelson. As Margaret said, I graduated from the University of Iowa this past May with a master's in library science and a certificate from the center of the book. I am currently the project archivist to the Salisbury House Library Collection at Grinnell College. But this evening we'll be speaking about my research from my term as an Olson graduate assistant and the current reading room exhibit up now. Over the course of my graduate degree, I had the opportunity to complement my studies in library science, book history, and material analysis with hands-on work in our special collections department, and I served as the Olson graduate assistant from January 2019 through this past summer. Projects with the Brewerly Hunt collection for me um, it became a large part of my work. What began as a task as an hourly student worker updating a manuscript inventory of the collection quickly became a passion, which has fueled my interest as an archivist, as well as research on book collectors and their collections. I am so excited to share even a small portion of what I've learned with you today. I would also like to preface that I am not a romantic literature scholar, nor a historian of this era. From getting to know this collection over the past few years, research including an independent study last fall and assisting Professor Eric Goodall's advanced course in the spring of 2020, which used romantic literature materials from our collection. I, to quote one of my former professors, know enough to be dangerous. I can act as a guide to understanding this unique collection's history and bring you along for a glimpse into the stacks of the Brewerly Hunt collection through the lives of the two bibliophiles for which it is named. We'll explore just how Iowa became the home of one of the world's most complete holdings of a single romantic era figure and learn more about the relationships modern librarians and researchers can foster as collectors and readers. Today, we are invited to join the Hunt Circle along with Luther Brewer across time and now virtually around the library table. Before diving into getting to know uh, Lee Hunt and Luther Brewer, and because of the circular nature of this collection's history, uh, I'd like to impress a few grounding comments on the moments of literary culture and book consumption in which Hunt and Brewer were placed and provide insight into. 
The Romantic Era or Romanticism was a movement across art, literature, music, and intellectual history primarily based in Europe between the late 1700s and the mid 1800s, roughly the 1780s to 1830s. On the spectrum of literary classification, the era was between the neoclassical and Victorian traditions. The period saw political shifts and upheaval in the later French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars, social and class changes around the world, and in the literary arts, shifts towards sensibility, individualism, pastoral ideals, and a romanticizing of nature and mysticism. This collection's romantics hail from England, an influential location for the movement. We'll learn more about Lee Hunt's place in English romanticism, but you'll most likely recognize the names of many of his good friends, John Keats, Mary and Percy Shelley, and Lord Byron. For the later romantics, books were an important commodity in social circles made possible by their moment in print culture and the new consumption of literary reprints, editions, and serialization. Hunt and his contemporaries were at a new moment for book ownership and lending within social circles. A century later in the 1920s, Luther Brewer was positioned at another turning point in book history and new modes of book collection. The fashionable hobby of book collecting was opening up beyond the mega rich. From the 1920s to the early Great Depression, the club-like world of book collectors welcomed new amateur members among the ranks of major booksellers like Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach of New York and the growth of such notable collections like that of the Lilly, Huntington, and Getty families. Book collectors of the upper middle class, like Luther Brewer, began to rise and with it, a new rare book market. Both Hunt and Brewer exemplify aspects of book culture in their times and help us further understand their relationship with these books and in turn, this collection as a whole. To understand the individuality of this collection and its significance, it is essential to have an introduction to Lee Hunt. Now, if you've never heard of Lee Hunt and you're wondering if you missed an important day of English class, I'd like to assure you, you did not. Although he at one time fancied himself a poet, Lee Hunt was most noted in his time as a journalist on the outskirts of, outskirts of fame and at the center of a prominent social circle. Today, he is most remembered because of these influential friendships and as a book collector himself through the work of Luther Brewer. James Henry Lee Hunt was born the 19th of October, 1784 in Southgate, London, the seventh of eight children born to Isaac and Mary Hunt. He was named after James Henry Lee, a pupil under his father's tutelage and the prominent son of a duke. It was later in life that he would be known singularly as Lee Hunt, and this would become adopted as the surname of his descendants. Hunt's parentage was colonial. His father was raised in Bridgetown, Barbados, a descendant of Tories who fled the rise of Cromwell, and his mother hailed from a prominent Philadelphia Quaker family. Isaac and Mary met in Philadelphia as Isaac studied law. They married and started their family in America. A loyalist during the American War of Independence, Isaac preceded his son's future political writings by publishing loyalist pamphlets, one of which is pictured here. These sympathies led to a narrow escape of being tarred and feathered by a mob and Isaac's swift departure for Barbados, then England. It was two years before the Hunt family, then numbering five children, were reunited. Embarking on a career as a preacher and tutor, Isaac Hunt's life was marked with financial trouble and debt, a trait that his son would come to share. Although Lee Hunt capitalized on an exotic claim of West Indian origin, his American ties were most prominent early in his life. The earliest letter in the collection was written by a five-year-old Lee to an aunt in Philadelphia. He would go on to attend a charity school, Christ Hospital, where his love of books was born out of seeking refuge in reading the shyness from a speech impediment and lack of interest in his studies. In his autobiography, Hunt describes, describes his early indoctrination as a glutton of books, fueled by the affordability of buying reprints and small volumes from book stalls and secondhand shops that a schoolboy of humble means could afford. This quote from his autobiography, he likens these small books to buttered crumpets, which he never seemed to keep around very long because 
he would always be loaning them out to friends. Featured here are a selection of buttered crumpets from our current exhibit. Hunt's love of poetry began in his youth. He had hopes of becoming a successful poet himself, but after the mixed reception of a fi excuse me, a family financed book of his juvenilia, he left hopes behind of becoming a poetic sensation at a young age, and he began his career with a short stint as a clerk at the war office. After a courtship spanning seven years, Hunt married Marianne Kent in 1809. He was then 25 and she was 21. Although an unflattering, um, excuse me, my notes decided to go a different direction. Um, although an unflattering portrayal of Marianne is given in my, many biographies of Hunt, as well as critics suggesting that the two were an ill-suited pair due to their temperaments, pleasant vignettes of the family are found in the multitude of letters that they exchanged throughout their courtship and marriage of 48 years. In an endearing note in our collection, which is pictured here, Lee sends a note posted from himself downstairs to his hardworking wife upstairs, likely delivered by one of their children. The couple had 10 children and throughout their marriage, Marianne followed Hunt through his imprisonment, travels and trying poverty. Her sister Elizabeth spent time with the family and acted as Hunt's transcriptionist for a time. Uh, Marianne also had an interest in art and she created paper cutout silhouettes of their family and friends. Pictured here are those of John Keats and Lord Byron. After leaving his clerk position at the war office, Lee joined his brother John in printing newspapers. Working as an editor and then contributor, Hunt gained renown as a theater critic and is considered a forerunner to modern theater reviews. Unlike many of the other critics at the time where their papers were in higher circulation, the Hunt brothers were not gifted free tickets, front row seats, or comped meals to encourage positive reviews like many of their peers were. Hunt's reviews were then brutally honest and it helped sell subscriptions. Hunt's earliest literary friendships were with essayist Charles Lamb and William Hazlitt, with whom he pioneered the familiar essay and the phrase roundtable as a series of discussions. John and Lee Hunt pursued a number of journals and papers together. The brothers emulated their father's impassioned political writing, but counter to their father's loyalist writings of the American Revolution, the brothers were critical of the crown. They were tried without conviction in libel court cases for publishing articles condemning the mistreatment of British troops and military corruption. In 1812, the brothers published in their paper, The Examiner, a sarcastic rebuttal to a Morning Post article, which was praising the Prince Regent, of whom they and other liberals were most critical. Referring to the Prince Regent, uh, who would later become King George IV in 1820, as a corpulent man of 50, a liar, and the companion of gamblers and demireps, landed the Hunt brothers back in court, and this time with a guilty verdict. Their sentence included fines and imprisonment for two years in prison. And you can read here the terms of their sentence. A pamphlet of the trial proceedings includes marginalia and the repetition of the verdict, guilty. Although incarcerated in separate jails, the brothers continued to publish and the Hunt social salon continued to grow with a guilty verdict came notoriety. While imprisoned at Surrey Jail on Horsemonger Lane, Hunt was allotted two adjoining rooms and permission for his young family, whoops, uh, for his young family, wife Marianne and young children to stay with him. John's conditions at Coldbath Fields were not as pleasant. His requests for further accommodations were denied and outlined in some of the correspondence to his brother, one of which is pictured here. The warden arranged for a carpenter and painter to outfit Lee and Marianne's rooms. Hunt goes on to describe his cell in his autobiography. I papered the walls with a trellis of roses. I had the ceiling colored with clouds and sky. The barred windows I screened with Venetian blinds and when my bookcases were set up with their busts and flowers and a pianoforte made their appearance, perhaps there was not a handsomer room on that side of the water. John did not have the same experience. While in prison, Hunt's journalism shifted to his passion for literature and poetry. 
From his jailhouse parlor, he entertained visitors such as friends Lamb and Hazlitt and new acquaintances like Lord Byron. Although with more pleasant accommodations, Hunt's health and spirit was severely impacted by his time in prison. He was released in 1815, but financial struggles continued to follow him for the rest of his life, and he was often dependent on the financial support of friends. His published works continued to be numerous throughout the rest of his life as he continued work as an editor and journalist. Among his most well-known titles are Winton Humor, The Town, and Old Court Suburb, these last two titles chronicling life in London, and the poems The Story of Rumini, Abu Ben Adhem, and Jenny Kissed Me. During his life, these works received mixed reception, but in recent years have gained appreciation by modern scholars. Hunt's presence and influence on his literary friends are perhaps more significant than his works alone. As an editor, he printed and promoted early works of John Keats and Percy Shelley in literary columns, as well as other poets that he befriended in Hampstead. He would also become a friend of Mary Shelley, who today is arguably the most famous of the circle. Of the most infamous Hunt Circle members pictured here, Mary would be the only other to live into middle age, and she and her son would continue to support Hunt financially. Lee Hunt and his peers were in the second generation of romantics, after figures like Coleridge and the Lake Poets. With many of these new poets from upstart backgrounds and writing dissenting liberal sentiment, the circle gained the nickname of the Cockney School by the conservative Blackwoods magazine, who crowned Hunt as King of the Cockneys for promoting these uncouth country and suburban authors. One of the most prominent Cockney poets of this circle was John Keats, whose Cockney accent was so thick, he would become nicknamed Junkets by his friends as it was an approximation of how he would pronounce his own name. Members of the Lee Hunt circle fostered each other's works, not only through promotion and financial assistance, but also through competition. You most likely heard the story of uh, Mary Shelley's inspiration for Frankenstein becoming born from a competition to write the best story at a Geneva villa in 1816 while with Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, and John William Polidori. Many cite that prompt and subsequent work as the birth of Gothic and science fiction. A charming vignette of another friendly competition within the circle was recorded in December of 1816 when Lee Hunt and John Keats drafted sonnets in competition. Their associate Charles Cowden Clark wrote about the event in his 1861 Recollections of Keats. From this account, we see a glimpse of this friendship and Hunt's encouragement of his young friend's poetry and Keats' admiration of Hunt's own work. A handwritten manuscript of Hunt's sonnet, sonnet is in our collection, but you may recognize Keats' sonnet, which begins, the poetry of earth is never dead, which is included in many of the compendiums of their works. Although centered about their literary lives, genuine friendships formed in the Hunt Circle. John Keats would stay with the Hunt family for extended visits, even as his health deteriorated, and he visited within months of his young death. The Shelleys were common guests at the Hunt home as well, and Percy would sail paper boats with Thornton Hunt, the Hunt's eldest child, on a pond near the Hunt's Vale of Health, Hampstead Cottage. There is an account from Thornton that once when they ran out of paper to make boats, uh, to his delight, Shelley pulled a banknote out of his pocket and fashioned a boat for them to sail, which goes to show the difference of financial situation for members of the circle. Traces of these literary and influential friendships are found in the margins of books and scrawled across years of correspondence at home in the Brewerly Hunt collection. There are numerous dedication or presentation copies with notes inscribed between the authors to their friends. Manuscripts with editorial notes or suggestions for edits are found. Maintaining a similar attitude towards his book as buttered crumpets best meant to be loaned, Lee Hunt often would loan or borrow books from his friends. In 1822, the Hunts had found their way to Italy intending to reunite with Byron and the Shelleys to embark on a new journal. Before all were reunited, Percy Shelley drowned in a boating accident. His body was identified by a book in his jacket pocket, a book he had borrowed from Lee Hunt, 
his own copy of their deceased friend Keats' last book of poetry. Hunt ordered the book burned with Shelley's body. Hunt outlived many of his prominent friends, becoming one of the few living remainders of this once significant circle. With their loss, he mourned not only friends, but financial security and notoriety. His financial struggles improved later in life as the recipient of pensions and annuities. In his later life, he developed a friendship with Charles Dickens, a new writer 28 years his junior, who was gaining popularity. Despite their friendship, the aggressively childish character Harold Skimpole of Bleak House, pictured in the center here, uh, was considered so reminiscent of Lee Hunt that acquaintances urged Dickens to amend the character or issue a public apology. Although a personal letter of apology from Dickens that he intended no harm to Hunt seems to have been sent as it was referenced in some later accounts, no copy of it exists today. The two, however, continued their friendship and would write and visit each other until Hunt's death. Hunt died in August of 1859 at the age of 74. He was preceded in death by his wife, Mary Ann, and many of his peers. Having spent a life most well known through sponsoring friends and books, it feels appropriate that a century later, Lee Hunt in his collections of books would posthumously make a new sponsoring friend dedicated to his legacy. Luther Adolphus Brewer was born in 1858 in Pennsylvania and as a young man moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Originally studying law, he became a bookkeeper and eventually editor of a newspaper. In 1898, he married Eleanor Taylor, a local Iowan who joined him in a love of books. Luther in 1907 established Torch Press, an operation complete with bookbinding, job printing, and a bookshop. A lover of books, Brewer was on the public library's board of trustees and sporadically collected books that caught his eye. One of the earliest books Brewer collected, a copy of Thomas Paine's Common Sense is in our collection. Brewer would go on to write some charming works about the hobby of book collecting, such as the joys and sorrows of a book collector and delights of a hobby. He retained many of the bookseller correspondence and catalogs he received over the years. In 1920, as Luther and his wife Eleanor began to lessen their commitments to Torch Press, they began to focus efforts on actively collecting books. They were interested in the Romantic era, but they wanted a more modest subject than the pricey manuscripts and editions of Keats or Byron that were already on the market. The Brewers set their sights on a peripherally known entity in Lee Hunt. Through the assistance of booksellers in Chicago, New York, and London, Brewer's collection of Hunt's first editions began to amass, and with it, a newfound interest. The Brewers became dedicated to researching the materials they acquired and that they sought on the market. A focus on first editions expanded to correspondence and manuscripts, and soon the Brewers had stumbled into being not only collectors, but somewhat expert scholars on Lee Hunt. Through Torch Press, Lee Hunt's poetry and essays such as my books were reprinted for the first time many in years. Eleanor supplied sketch frontispieces for many of the Torch Press Lee Hunt editions. The Brewer's writings and guides to the collection are invaluable and make for a rich experience and unique understanding of both object and collector. In December of 1920, the Brewers invited friends to join them in their Cedar Rapids home around the library table through one of their annual Torch Press Christmas books. Throughout the charming pamphlet, they answer questions posed by friends about their Lee Hunt books and their excitement of this collection. Brewer was asked about a favorite book on his shelf. And although he avoids designating a favorite child as he refers to them, he shares an anecdote about one of his favorite items. Bound in a saffron cloth with gilt edges, a copy of Hunt's wit and humor includes the dedication to Mrs. Shelley, I mean Mary, from her affectionate friend, L.H. When visiting his friend and bookseller, Walter Hill of Chicago, Brewer stumbled on this book in a lot just delivered from London. He remarks that meeting this precious volume inspired the same feelings of longing for companionship he had upon meeting his wife, and that he became tearful at such a great find. 
he sadly learned that the bookseller intended to keep it for his own private collection. But eventually, lucky for Brewer and lucky for us, Hill gave in. The bookseller went on to tell Luther that no one had a better right to the book and that his comprehensive Lee Hunt collection would find it more worthy companions than any other collector's library. Brewer added an inscription to the book that should he die before Walter Hill, the book should be returned to the bookseller as he wished that it be in the possession of a man who will lavish on it the same affection. I read about this book first in this article by the Brewers and for weeks, I wasn't sure if it had indeed been returned to Walter Hill in the 1930s if Luther Brewer had preceded him in death. Although our catalog listed multiple copies of the title from the correct edition, binding and inscri inscription information were not included in the catalog. There was also the reality that with some of the mysteries of this collection and its long history before special collections come some shelf lost items. And I feared that this item might have been one of them or had indeed found its way back to Chicago in the 1930s. After shelf reading and pulling every copy of wit and humor on the brewer shelves, I found it nestled in a conservation box with no spine title. Having it in hand that day, I understand completely how Luther Brewer felt finding this book, and I hope that it does feel the same affection uh, with us in special collections. In 1933, Eleanor Brewer died suddenly and was followed in the later months by Luther. The Brewer estate was left to the greater family as the couple had no children. Although there were some indications that the Brewers had intended for the collection to come to the State University of Iowa Library, no such intention was listed in their wills. A niece became the representative of the book collection. It appeared that this curated library, one that had remarkably come to find an unlikely but welcome home in Iowa, would be dispersed at auction. The Brewer collection as a whole was to be placed on the market. Through the financing of an anonymous donor, the university was able to negotiate with the family agent for the sum of $20,000 for the purchase of the collection in its entirety in 1934, and the collection was acquired. Predating the establishment of a special collections department, the collection was housed in its own room in Schaefer Hall and was accessible upon permission of the head librarian to researchers. Today, the collection encompasses the core materials acquired in 1934 from the Brewer Estate and pertinent materials acquired since. In total, this includes over 2,300 monograph volumes and nearly 2,000 manuscripts and manuscript letters in bound volumes and unbound in archival boxes. A fireplace from one of Lee Hunt's final homes is also in the collection. The Brewer Lee Hunt collection is one of the largest and most complete holdings of a Romantic era figure. The collection includes significant original manuscripts, letters and monographs from Hunt and his circle, as well as many fine editions of their works, collection history, including bibliography and writings from the Brewers about this collection and modern criticism and scholarship. As highly collectible materials of Hunt's circle were snatched up by private collectors and in institutions around the world, this niche collection has likely be become the largest and most complete of any of the Romantic era figures. Through the research and meticulous records of the Brewers, it provides an excellent opportunity for the study of book collection and the book market in the 1920s and 1930s. Here at the University of Iowa, it has become an exciting collection for instruction of students with literature, politics, history, and book studies courses, as well as supporting independent scholarly research in these areas. The Lee Hunt Letters Online Initiative has digitized nearly all 1600 manuscript letters in the collection that are available for research virtually through the Iowa Digital Library. I'm delighted to share a look today at Around the Library Table, an exhibition which was installed at the end of October in the reading room. Originally scheduled for the in in installation in May of 2020, and as the capstone of my Olson term, this exhibit and talk were postponed. Um, and I'm grateful to the department for inviting me to install this as a guest curator. This exhibit was made possible with the assistant of Megan Levinez, 
who is completing her graduate degree in SLIS this year and works in our department. As an exhibit assistant, Megan helped me navigate what it looks like to curate an exhibit in the time of COVID from a distance um, and was a huge help in completing selection layouts and coordinating, coordinating with conservation to make the copious notes and very large Google Drive folder I had before we went remote into the exhibit that we have today. So again, thank you, Megan. This exhibit features some of the most curious things in the Brewerly Hunt collection and items that helped illustrate the lives of the two bibliophiles for which it is named. We would need many more evenings to take a look at them all. So I will highlight a few and encourage you to visit the exhibit at the main library if you are able or to stay tuned for an upcoming digital exhibit which will be available in early 2021. To visit the main library, which is currently accessible only to university users without previous appointment, please aim, email the department's reference account or contact Liz Reardon directly. Among one of the most curious items in the collection and in this exhibit is a lock of John Keats hair, which is seen here. This lock of hair was owned by Lee Hunt as a memento to his long lost friend and is accompanied with odes by some of its later owners. The collection is also home to locks of Lee Hunt's hair from several times in his life. So if you're looking for a unique keepsake for the holidays and are also have an upcoming DIY haircut, you have a new idea for you. Although I'm not sure how a future archivist curating your papers will feel about that. Um, an exciting and less hairy item making its exhibition debut is a dual letter from Mary Shelley and Lee Hunt to their friend Edward Trelawney. Written in 1827, this letter includes messages from both Hunt and Shelley to a lengthy, um, and includes also a lengthy edition by Mary, which is written upside down and between the lines of a page of Hunt's message. At the time of this letter being written, Mary was now a widow of five years and following Trelawney's escapades in the Greek war and bit of a celebrity, um, his, he divorced his first wife and he and Mary Shelley began courting. Um, this ended abruptly and Mary never remarried. There's gotta be a novel in there somewhere and I can't wait for that to come out. This is one of the most recent acquisitions to the Brewerly Hunt collection and it's something that's really exciting to see um, in person. For our last exhibit feature, um, I will take a look at one of the more curious items in the stacks, the fireplace surround of one of Hunt's Hammersmith homes. Hunt lived on Cornwall Road, Hammersmith from 1852 until his death in 1859, where he moved from the home where this fireplace once resided to another home farther down the block. In a letter to his friend, Charles Ollier, describing a visit from the reconciled Charles Dickens in 1855, Hunt's postscript offers a rare description of this very fireplace. Our Lee Hunt fireplace arrived at the library in 1986 from Desmond Lee Hunt, a great great grandson of Lee and Mary Ann Hunt. Without much effort, you can picture Lee Hunt reading by the fire, and we're invited to join him and Luther Brewer next to it. I would also like to give a special thanks to our exhibit illustrator, Zoe Webb, who created the original art for our exhibit and created the paper boat um, with a facsimile banknote for Percy Shelley. The poster is inspired by the original blue paper wrappers of serials like Dickens' Bleak House and features vignettes of the lives of Brewer and Hunt. Uh, I would, before I close, I would also be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to thank Megan Lemonez, Zoe Webb, and Damien Eerig, who over the last few years have become a modern Lee Hunt circle of sorts in Iowa. They have patiently listened to me ramble about an obscure romantic and his cronies for hours. They've attempted to help me crack a collector's numbering code, and they even dressed up as, as we call them, the bromantics um, for a department skit that we did last year. Um, they've helped me to think about the different types of bros that the circle would be in 2020, um, which is invaluable research. I so appreciate your patience, assistance as colleagues and friendships. 
And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for joining me, Lee Hunt, and Luther Brewer this evening around a virtual library table. It's appropriate to close with a quote from Lee Hunt's My Books. I do not care to be anywhere without a book or books at hand. I look forward to being able to gather again in the future and to be able to have these books in hand around the library table together. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you again for joining us tonight. <laughs>